Well, Ambassador Edelman, thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you, Stefan. It's, it's a pleasure, an thank honor. Yes. An honor is all mine. Yeah. Uh, I want to start with uh, the time and age that we're having this interview today. Okay. We're arriving at the end of this semester. Yep. For me, I'm arriving at the half point of my final semester as an undergrad. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. I want to uh, start off with this interview with uh, you know, this question. You know, Looking back to the time when you were a college senior at the University of Georgia, did you ever envision your career to have unfolded in the manner that it has? Or do you feel like there have been unexpected turns here and there? Oh, it's a great question. Um, it's definitely unexpected turns. I hope that I was very intentional about my career. And I, as an undergraduate in Athens, Georgia, which is a very kind of classic college town in a, you know, my state school, I definitely had a sense that the, um, the paths that crossed the campus could lead me anywhere. Um, I felt that I was, you know, I felt the opportunities, but I couldn't have predicted sort of where it all would have gone, and um, nor would I want to. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I love the opportunity to have sort of moved around the world a little bit and done some things. And I know we're going to talk about being a lawyer, and I think being a lawyer enabled me to do so. That's awesome. And before you were a lawyer, you first went to law school. And I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you this question because recently, uh, Justice, uh, one of the justices of the United States Supreme Court, I believe it was uh, Justice Gorsuch, who said that, uh, who essentially posed a question, saying that do we really need seven years for our society to produce competent lawyers? Mm. I feel like this question really gets to a sort of a larger uh, issue, is the issue of affordability and accessibility of the legal education and the legal profession. Do you feel like there have been any progress in the field in terms of uh, allowing more people from underrepresented backgrounds, from lower income backgrounds to join the legal profession? Do you feel like uh, Justice Gorsuch's proposition has any good values? Yeah, well, it's a complicated question, so let me let me take it in a few different parts. Um, you probably don't need seven years of higher education to produce a competent lawyer, but maybe, and I want to be very respectful of Justice Gorsuch, Gor Gorsuch, but maybe that's not the right question. We're not just trying as a society to produce competent lawyers. Maybe competent lawyers with more of a world view or who are also well-rounded ultimately serve their clients and serve society better. So it's more than just producing people who can do the blocking and tackling of law. Um, it's, you know, law is not mechanics. There's more to it. And so maybe seven years is important. Um, and maybe those seven years are useful for producing competent lawyers who also are well-rounded people and have a worldview, and ultimately those become the type of lawyers who can best serve their clients and society. Um, you know, as far as you know, affordability and representation, um, I don't really have the statistics on that. So, so you know, forgive me for that. I understand from what I read, um, for example, that. Um, the majority of law students now are women. That's progress. Which that, is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Decades, um, yeah. I don't know if that's the case in other professional schools. My sense is that MBA programs are not majority female. I don't know what's going on in medical schools these days. I can tell you in international relations in the program you know, where I have taught as an adjunct professor, um, it's overwhelmingly male students. Um, so that's the starting point. I think law seems to be doing a good job in reflecting society, which is a majority female, slight majority female. As far as you know, underrepresented groups, underrepresented groups like um, African Americans, uh, Hispanic groups. Again, I don't have the statistics, but I do have an experience um, as having been uh, the president of the Law Alumni Association at my law school. I went to the Emory Law School in Atlanta, Georgia, and as the president of the um, Alumni Association, which was just a one-year thing um, as president, I guess I had served on the board for some time, and then ultimately a member of something that I believe was called the Law School Dean's Council. I don't even know if it still carries that name. I'm not as active at, at Emory Law School as I once was. There was a great focus on the diversity of the class, 
how are we going to attract more minority students into the entering class at Emory Law School, all the while, you know, continuing a law school admissions process that was merit-based. Um, and our goal, not surprisingly, was to create more awareness of Emory Law School to um, recruit, if you will, uh, create visibility in places where minority students, undergraduate students, would more likely have um, uh, access to Emory. In Atlanta, that, you know, Atlanta, you know, has the good fortune of being home to um, very prominent um, historically black colleges and universities, Morehouse, you know, Morehouse, um, Spelman, um, Clark Atlanta, Morris Brown, you know, these are all, you know, very prominent schools. And so at Emory, I know there was an emphasis in trying to attract um, the best students from those schools into Emory Law School. Um, I think the results were kind of mixed. Um, one way we talked about doing that, I don't know how successful we were, was to offset the high costs of what was, you know, a private school um, by devoting more of the um, law school's budget towards underwriting um, tuition subsidies for those students in particular, for all students in need, but for those students in particular. Um, but it's hard for me to say. I don't know sort of how diverse the profession is or how diverse the law school census is these days. I absolutely agree with your observation. For me, I'm going to an international relations program at Schwartzman next year. And they recruit way more men than women that are taken on a yearly basis. And I've raised this with them. Yeah. They feel like that's the pool of the applications that they're receiving. So I feel like perhaps at the very root of it, there could be more business awareness, or at least encouraging people to try to consider the legal profession uh, to start with. Yeah, there's a balance that has to be struck, right? Because you're not doing anyone any favors if you're compromising on the caliber of students. You know, in, in the long term, I think you're undermining Exactly. The process. Um, so how do we, as a profession, um, attract the best students to law school, right. whether they be from the minority groups or underrepresented groups or not? You know, they're, who are law schools competing with? They're competing with the MBA programs. They're competing with, you know, people who go directly into the workforce. They're competing with, you know, other, you know, graduate programs, you know, Schwartzman, uh, for example. So, you know, it's tricky for, for law schools because you're asking people to make a three-year commitment. Um, law is super competitive, not just being in law school, but then sort of the first day you step out as a new law graduate, you're stepping into a highly competitive environment. There are a lot of lawyers. In America, there are more lawyers than there is legal work. And so there's a, you know, a mismatch. There's always going to be legal work for, for good lawyers. And for good young lawyers, that's never there's never going to be a shortage, um, but it's uh, it's very competitive. It's more competitive now than it was when I was coming out a generation ago, and my guess is a generation from now it'll be even more competitive because of you know other factors. And speaking of being a lawyer, uh, many lawyers are encouraged or often required to do pro bono work in a sense, volunteer service uh, to help people who are in need, to help people who are in vulnerable backgrounds. Uh, one of the questions that I really wanted to ask you is you have been dedicated, you dedicated a lot of your time when you were a lawyer to serving veterans, to serving people experiencing domestic violence and all kinds of uh, challenges that people have in their lives. And I feel like this question, you're uniquely well positioned to answer that. Is that to, to what extent do you feel like the pro bono work that you do and lawyers do in general help not only their underrepresented clients, but also the legal professionals themselves? Sure, sure. Well, first, you're very nice, but I am not uniquely um, qualified to speak to these issues. And that's what's beautiful about the profession. Many, if not most lawyers, and perhaps even all lawyers, I think, are qualified to speak to this issue because I think in the legal profession, we do two things, I want to be careful how I say this, better than any other profession. Um, um, we do ethics training and pro bono. So you asked the question about pro bono. Let's talk about pro bono. I don't know of any other profession, and there may very well be, where regardless of where you're practicing, you can be a sole practitioner in a small town, 
or you can be part of you know the biggest law firms in the world you know working here on wall street or working in in washington dc and without exception there is a sense that you have a an obligation to devote some of your time to pro bono to providing free services to those who not only cannot afford your services but maybe are at times the most reviled people in society, um, those who have the sort of greatest legal risk, whether they be criminal defendants or sort of otherwise, you know, outcast um, by society. And lawyers take great pride in representing those people. And to me, it's the sign of a true professional. You know, lawyers understand that they've been given this gift. Um, of being able to practice law, and I'm speaking of American lawyers when I say this, I don't pretend to know, you know all of the legal systems in the world, but American lawyers, and I suppose I know a little bit about you know, the British system, British lawyers are given this license, this opportunity that you know, people, uh, most people don't have. They're given this training, they have this training, and the beautiful thing about being a lawyer is, is your ability in this profession is never exhausted. You always have it. It's not like you're, you know, working in the coal mine or you're working on the machine. It's it's here. You always have it. It's never exhausted and it's only valuable or useful in its expenditure. So there's no reason to save it. There's no reason to hoard it. It should be sort of offered to all. Yeah, you have to make a living. You want to take care of your family. Everyone wants sort of personal upward mobility. You want to contribute to the success of your law firm or your uh, business or your organization as a lawyer. But you can at the same time, you know, without compromising your ability to do that, you can also um, um, realize the value of what you have by the expenditure on behalf of those who cannot afford it. And on the sort of most reviled in society, um, you know, I think of, you know, the example in the sort of uh, in the days, weeks, and even years, um, you know, after the American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there were these um, people, Guantanamo. right? Yeah. These people who were picked up on the battlefield, suspected terrorists, taken to Guantanamo Bay. Um, imprisoned and you know because of their status which became a legal question in and of itself were not afforded due process rights and the same rights that a criminal defendant might have in uh, if he if he or she was an American citizen or even on American soil when he or she was arrested or, or detained lawyers from the best firms in the world um, gave their time traveled to Guantanamo represented these individuals um, these individuals were the, probably the most unpopular people in society. They were considered to have been terrorists, murderers. Um, and yet, you know, the American legal system and lawyers took great pride in the fact that they were getting the very finest representation, not even just adequate representation. It was like the best lawyers went to Guantanamo to do this work. It, it was a um, really interesting, I think, chapter in the American legal profession of which I hope American lawyers are proud. I know I am. And I was not one of those people. I didn't go down there. I actually was in a law firm where some of my partners did it. Um, I didn't do it, but I took pride in the work they were doing. I absolutely agree. I feel like it's one of the, it's, it really shows the true colors of a profession when, you know, when it's the most mild people in society that you're yeah. representing. Yeah. 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 And look, I mean, I'm, physicians do this. I, I, I don't know what accountants do. I mean, other professions do this. I, I have a bias. I think lawyers do it, you know, better than anyone. And I understand that. Uh, I feel like, you know, you mentioned that representing one of the work of the pro bono, one, one part of pro bono work is representing perhaps the most the outcasts, right? The yeah. marginalized people and also the, the most vile people in society. And that brings me to the question of, you know, the image and the reputation of the legal professions. How do you feel like the requirement to do pro bono work has facilitated or in a sense contributed to the reputation of lawyers and the legal profession? You know, also, and also considering other factors that are perhaps somewhat damaging to the legal profession in yeah. recent years. Yeah. Well, you know, the surveys don't lie. You know, lawyers' <laughs> lawyers' reputations are are low. Society 
Put it on Congress. For whatever reason. Yeah, he's Congress, car salesman. I don't know sort of where the pecking order is. Um, but, you know, lawyers typically don't enjoy, um, you know, um, the, the sort of love and affection of the general public. Um, I don't think lawyers care that much about that. That's the first thing. I think lawyers sort of generally understand that the community of lawyers is like most other communities. There are some people who, you know, live to higher standards and some people who I suppose live to minimal or practice to minimal standards, you know, they're just people and they're so the full range is, is, is represented, I'm sure. Um, my experience around lawyers is, has been around people who I think, you know, try to live to very high um, standards. You know, I hope that sort of the pro bono lawyers do enhances the reputation of the profession. I'm not sure the general public even knows right. what lawyers do. And, what, and I don't know if maybe there should be some sort of campaign out there that done by the bar associations, right. or maybe it doesn't matter that much. Um, a lot has changed in the profession since I entered it. You know, when I entered the legal profession, lawyers were forbidden, prohibited from advertising. Now, when you flip on a television in, in most cities, it's, it's, it's everywhere. You know, it's everywhere. It's, you know, it's, have you been injured? You know, call 1-800, whatever. And I guess that's good. It's, it's creating access for people. Um, but I, I just, it's, it's, it's different. Right. Uh, I'll use the word different. Exactly. Yeah. It also creates a lot of anxieties for one else or doing torts. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, that's the competitive part of this, Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And comparing the legal profession with other professions, you've mentioned that uh, the legal profession is perhaps one of the few, if not the only one, that requires a volunteer service, free services for people who need it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it right. requires. Maybe some state bars have, a, have an actual hourly right. requirement. Where I practiced law in Georgia, it wasn't a... Re Ethics training was required, but pro bono wasn't required. It was encouraged to in maintain. Sense. Yeah, but everywhere I know of, it was encouraged. That's, Understood. That's right. And, and in some law firms, it was required. You want to work at this law firm, you're going to dedicate, you know, this, you know, this sort of number of hours or this kind of effort to pro bono if you want to stay or if you want to advance, you know, in this right. in this law firm. And do you feel like this kind of encouragement or just the kind of structure of pro bono work could it be ever applied or could even be beneficial to some other professions like finance that you've been in? Or do you feel like that is very different, far away from the culture that it has now that is not really feasible at this point? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a good question. Um, if you'd ask the question about medicine, it would be easier, right? Um, I don't know if finance, for example, really lends itself to that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of organized in a different way. Like, you know, how you're let's say you're a finance professional you're here in new york and you're working at you know a big bank sort of how you can use your expertise in finance to help those who are most in need or you know least able to afford it i'd have to think about that now what you can do is you can say you know everyone in finance should volunteer their time in some way you know you can maybe not volunteer yourself as a financial professional but you can certainly, you know, engage in community service and engage in volunteerism, and I think I think a lot of places do that. I, I I know when I was at Goldman Sachs, you know, that was a part of the culture. There was, you know, sort of a, a, an expectation that you would participate in in certain certain sort of community service and social responsibility type of of activities. I don't know that it was enforced necessarily, but. It was part of the culture, and I would expect in other, especially large financial institutions, they have similar opportunities and similar encouragement. Um, but I don't know that it's required. And I don't know how you could sort of require finance professionals to give away their finance services to you know, those who are in need. That I think law sense, yeah. organizes it. And, and law is different in the sense that, um, look, the legal system in America is the place, the only place, where a person can lose their liberty. You know, that there's this process by which someone's freedoms can be taken from them. And that's why we have, you know, all of the protections in the Constitution, all of the protections in the Bill of Rights to, to make sure that, you know, freedom's not taken from someone wrongly. And so lawyers 
you know, are part of that system that protects the innocent from being falsely accused or, or falsely, I suppose, convicted. And that's unique to the legal system. Right. Um, certainly, you know, what's at stake for healthcare professionals is, you know, also quite important. People's, you know, literally people's lives, um, their, you know, uh, well-being and health are, are at risk. And I suppose that's probably why, you know, doctors also have the same um, ethos of, you know, devoting their time as volunteers. My mother's a doctor, so I really appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> and you mentioned that uh, one of the powers of law, one of the unique features of law is that, in a sense, it, it, it really impacts people's personal freedoms, the fundamentals of people's well-being, in a sense, that can be affected by the justice system. And I wanted to ask you about that particularly, because we realized that, uh, you know, the Constitution guarantees everyone the right to a lawyer, regardless of, in a sense, the public's, uh, you know, accusations or the public's feelings towards them. But there are certain cases where, perhaps some of the extreme cases, that the public feels very strongly about a person. And this person perhaps can hire the best lawyers, the best attorneys. And in a sense, that, from my personal observations, has been one of the draws that really, uh, or one of the pulls that really gets uh, or damages the reputation of the legal profession, at least in the public view. Do you feel like there could be some way in which the legal profession could get the message across, in a sense, letting people understand more about lawyers representing quote unquote bad people, like Harvey Weinstein, for example, mm, before mm. he went to trials? Or do you feel like there could be some, in a sense, legitimate concerns because people who are as wealthy, let's say, let's Harvey Weinstein, who hire you know extremely competent lawyers, but then let's say if he is facing us, uh, you know, a, a prosecution team that is less experienced, perhaps he could get away with it. What do you? Uh, what are your personal feelings on that issue? Yeah, I mean, I understand the question, and and there's, I I think, and 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 make let me make sure I understand the question fully. You know, there's this idea that if you're wealthy enough, you can hire lawyers who are so clever right. <laughs> that you can um, tilt the scales of justice in your favor. And you know, I'm sure, and and that sort of idea that um, general um, belief in society undermines you know fairness which is so central to our to our system that sort of the rich you know have an advantage um, it's a complicated question um, I don't think we should disadvantage people because they have resources. And I think people who have resources should be, of course, should be able to, to hire the representatives, the legal representatives they want, who are, you know, lawyer doesn't have to take the case. You know, they decide right. to take the case. Um, and, and so I don't think there should be a disadvantage. The question is, if you don't have the resources, can you still get the, the finest lawyers? How do we get the finest lawyers to not only represent the rich and powerful, but to also represent the those who otherwise could not afford? And that's why I think these pro bono exactly. that this pro bono ethos is so effective. Um, will uh, you know? I don't want to use names, but will some of the richest sort of um, um, magnates in business always be able to get? the best lawyers? I suppose, yes. That's the system we have. Are there amazing lawyers in the offices of public, public defenders. defenders across yeah. the country? Absolutely, yes. They come from the finest law schools. They have the great, great ex you know, decades of experience. They know their way around courtrooms. I mean, they can, I hope you don't mind me saying they can go toe to toe with anyone. Um, and so, I hope the system continues to value public defenders in the criminal system, um, uh, legal services in the civil system, so that um, legal services or public defender offices can retain highly talented people so they can you know, ensure that the scales of justice are at least balanced, yes. um, regardless of um, your place in society, whether it be by wealth or, or power. And that brings me to the question of public service. You've had a long career in public service that is so admirable that I feel like our audiences would just find it to be amazing. 
Uh, and I wanted to start with your uh, career in the Georgia State Legislature. Yeah. You served as a Georgia State Senator. And during your time in the Georgia State Senate, you experienced uh, perhaps the early stage of the bipartisan pol uh, polarization we're seeing today. Perhaps it's a lot better yeah, back in yeah, those days compared yeah. to what we have today. And considering uh, the, the global situation that we are facing now, we're seeing so many wars around the world, the war in Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, the war in Congo and in, in, uh, on the continent of Africa. Uh, do you feel like in dangerous times like this, yeah. do the two parties, in a sense, uh, bridge the divide across the political spectrum? Or do you feel like dangerous times like this drive an even you know, bigger divide between the two parties? Yeah, so... So it's a big question you've asked, and there's there's a lot in there. So let me say a couple things, um, and let me let me back up, and then I'm gonna. I hope I'm gonna get to the what, what you're finally driving at. First, I've been very lucky. I consider myself a, a lucky one. I've had different things in in my life occur that have inspired me personally to make decisions about my career path. How did I get to law school? I'll tell you how I got to law school. Nothing happened in my undergraduate years. Something happened to me in high school. In high school, um, and I was not a very good high school student. I oh, that's uh, very humble. Very yeah, immature, sure. and you know, was more interested in basketball and and cars and that kind of thing. And but one day, um, and I'm not sure exactly what the full context was. I was taking a class in some sort of social studies. And we, we took a field trip. It wasn't my senior year. It must have been either my sophomore or junior year. We took a field trip to the Emory Law School. Wow. And we were being asked to serve as jurors in a mock trial competition that was happening um, at the law school. And it was actually very interesting because, yeah. uh, don't hold me to these numbers, but I think the juries were like eight member juries and they had there must have been an odd number. So it must have been nine member juries and they had um, you know, four or five high school students and then four or five senior citizens who I guess they had gotten out of one of the senior citizen centers. Sure. And that was the jury composition and they tried this, the law students tried this case um, and I guess they had either other law students or some you know, actors or something as, as witnesses and they brought in a a lawyer or a local judge to be the judge and they did this mock trial and i was absolutely captivated by that i and i decided then i wanted to go to law school i didn't know anything i didn't have any lawyers in my family my parents had never even dealt with lawyers you know i mean i didn't know any lawyers i didn't even know anyone whose parents were lawyers but i had that experience and i never forgot it and it was very much you know in my mind and as i went through my undergraduate education, I actually always knew I was going to apply and hopefully attend law school. So pretty amazingly, I guess five or six years later, I walked into that same building into the Emory Law School as a student, you know, as, as a 1L. Um, a similar sort of unusual thing happened to me that got me into the Georgia State Senate. I was practicing law, um, a commercial law practice. Yeah, I was doing my pro bono and my other stuff, but you know, I had a commercial law practice. I had a very traditional practice representing, you know, large businesses. And I was very fortunate to have a mentor at the law firm. Um, her name is Teresa Wynn Roseboro. She's right today. She is the general counsel of the Home Depot company. Um, a very successful, you know, amazing lawyer. Um, she had clerked for Justice Stevens on the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, just an incredible person. And um, I considered her my mentor. And um, in the year 2000, uh, we had an election, a national election in the United States that was very close. Um, in the state of Florida. It was very yeah. close. Every, well, the every national state. election was very close, but it was particularly yeah. close. And it was decisive in Florida, where very famously, you know, one of our largest states, you know, came down to um, just north of 500 vote um, difference. And there were all sorts of recount statutes that were triggered by the closeness of the election. And the supporters of then Texas Governor George W. Bush um, um, uh, and the supporters of then Vice President um, Al Gore sort of were engaged in this litigation over the constitutionality of these recount statutes and maybe even you know more so 
how, they're, how they were being applied, how the recounts by these local canvassing boards, they were called, you know, were, were, were being conducted. And Teresa um, received a call from her former co-clerk at the U.S. Supreme Court, Ron Klain, who was acting, I guess, as the chief of staff to right. Al Gore and said, listen, um, there's all these recounts, things going up. This is like in, this was within less than 24 hours, you know, after sort of the whole election experience and people realized it was too close to call. Um, listen, there's these, all these state cases going on in the state of Florida. I don't need you for that. There's a million lawyers volunteering, but there's this one federal case in the Southern District of Florida and it's in the courtroom of, of Judge Richard Middlebrooks. And of course, Florida sits in the 11th Circuit which, you know, which resides in Atlanta. And I'm going to need an 11th Circuit lawyer, regardless of what comes out of Judge Middlebrook's court in the Southern District of Florida. I know there's going to be an appeal. It's going to be in Atlanta. Teresa, you know, you're the best. Um, I want you to be ready to be our 11th Circuit lawyer. And by pure luck, because I had been lucky enough to have this mentor, um, in the day of, you know, day or maybe two days by then after the election, um, my phone rings uh, at home and it's um, Teresa. And I remember it very vividly because of all things, it was, it was um, my mother's birthday and my mother was wow. there and the whole family was there and we were singing happy birthday to my mother and the phone rang and my wife, you know, Caroline grabbed the phone and she comes, she says, David, it's Teresa. And I, I was like, just tell her it's my mother's birthday. I'll call her back. And so then Caroline comes back and says, she says, it's really important. So I went and got the phone and I said, you know, yes. She goes, well, you know what's going on with the election? I said, of course, we're all glued to the television. We don't know who the next president's going to be. And she said, well, you know, we've been hired and get down to the office right now. And so I, I remember saying, mom, I know how this looks and I know it's your birthday, but I'm actually going to go to work right now. Um, and I left the birthday party and went to work and, and, um, you know, for the next 36 days, I was engaged in this incredible litigation at the federal level. Um, the leader of our litigation team was Professor Tribe at the Harvard Law School. Um, he effectively moved himself to Washington and we set up, or he set up kind of a, a war room, if you will, in the Watergate Hotel. And um, there was a team of lawyers, Teresa, and by extension, you know, myself and a few of our other colleagues in our law firm were part of it. And many highly distinguished law professors and law school deans and other Supreme Court practitioners were a part of it. I was, to say I was junior probably exaggerates my role. I was, you know, minor, minor, minor person, but nonetheless had this incredible experience of representing the Vice President of the United States before the 11th Circuit and then being on the briefs, you know, to the US Supreme Court multiple times. I was a lawyer who had never had his name on a brief um, um, presented or filed at the U.S. Supreme Court. And after 36 days of this, I think my name was on like, you know, 10 of them. Um, it was a remarkable experience. And about halfway through that experience, I think it was like the 17th or 18th day after the election, um, I went home from Washington. I was, I was back in Atlanta to sort of get laundry done and sort of do that kind of stuff. Um, and it happened to be that day that um, uh, uh, the Florida legislature had convened a special session. And remember, the governor at the time the brother. was the brother of George W. Bush. Jeb Bush was the, the sitting governor of Florida. And so he I'm, you know, there was some participation by Jeb Bush in, in the politics of it all. And the Florida legislature convened a special session for purposes um, of certifying the Florida electors to Governor George W. Bush and ultimately ending the recount. And their argument was along the lines, it wasn't a legal argument. It was along the lines of, you know, sort of in the interest of stability, you know, in the interest of like, you know, creating some certainty around this election, we're going to do this. It wasn't, well, you know, we counted the ballots and, you know, Governor Bush won or George w, Governor George W. Bush won. It was in the interest of like getting this over with. And I, that offended my sensibilities. I was, you know, I, of course, I was a little bit of a combatant. I was in the case and I believed we were going to win and right. at least we were going to get the votes counted, you know, fairly. 
and the recount statutes were going to sort of do what they were designed to do, which was, I remember Professor Tribe in his oral, one of his oral arguments saying it, it was just, it was a, it was a, um, too close to call, a photo finish. And the recount statutes, I remember him saying, are like a giant magnifying glass looking at the photo just to see who actually won. And that's all we're doing. And there's nothing illegal or improper. And that's why the recount statutes are, are there. And should the shoe be on the other foot, we would be defending the recount statutes uh, in either case. And um, it was that moment I made a promise to myself and a promise to my wife that should the Florida recount be stopped and the election be delivered to George Bush without the full recount um, that I was going to run for the state legislature. And uh, that's what happened. And much to my surprise, I was elected in 2002. I had no experience in the legislature and I was not, I was sort of an unlikely um, politician. I, I, was, I had not been my class president. I had not been some social fraternity chairman. I just, I'm pretty sure I'd never seen my name on a ballot now that I think about it. Um, but I did it. I ran because I had decided it was important who was in these seats in these state houses. Um, and I was elected on a very unusual day. I was elected as a Democrat in Georgia on a day when Georgia, the same day, when Georgia elected its first Republican governor oh, since wow. Reconstruction. Wow. Um, Sonny Perdue became the governor. The Georgia legislature um, had elected a majority. There were 56 Georgia state senators. Everyone ran every two years and had elected 30 Democrats and 26 Republicans. And by the end of you know the week, four of the uh, individuals, four of the people who had been elected as Democrats switched parties. So it became a Republican controlled, right. became a Republican controlled legislature. All sorts of political powerhouses had been defeated. You know, longstanding Democratic legislators had been defeated. You know, for another interview, we'll talk about how that happened. But I found myself as a freshman state senator in Georgia, I think the youngest or one of the youngest in the chamber, having sort of thought I was, if I was lucky enough to get elected, that I would be sitting on the back row and working the seniority system and watching the sort of more experienced uh, individuals and learning from them, I found myself sort of in a different situation. I was in the state legislature. A lot of the people who I, I suppose was expecting to be learning from were defeated. Mm -hmm. um, others had like switched parties. Yeah. And so there was a, a dynamic there that caused me to sort of have an accelerated um, experience and move pretty quickly up the ranks, you know, in my caucus, in the Democratic caucus, and as a result, up the ranks, I guess, in, in the body. So I served for eight years. I ended up being a chairman of a committee. I was the only Democrat, actually, in, in the legislature to be asked to be a chairman of a committee. Um, I ended up sort of having a political career that I think was considered, I was a moderate Democrat, and, and people would say I worked across you know, party lines and across the aisle. And um, you're right in your question that the place started to become more partisan towards my seventh and eighth year. But certainly when I first got there, there were divisions and divides, but they really weren't partisan. There was a big divide between urban and rural legislators, for example. Right. And I would say that was even more pronounced that than the party right. divisions. You know, the 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 guys, and they mostly were guys, you know, the guys from Atlanta, whether they're, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, they tended to stick together. Right. And the guys from South Georgia, you know, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, tended to stick together. The guys from the mountains, from North Georgia, they tended to stick together. And those were the groupings. Um, and then I would say by the time it was, you know, my towards the end of my um, legislative career, the division started becoming Republican and Democrat. Do we need sort of people to, you know, somehow get back to where we were of working across party lines, especially in these, you know, dangerous times, as you've described? Yeah, you know, of course. I mean, you, know, you wouldn't find anyone who would say partisanship has been good. Um, can we get there is the harder question. And it's hard to know. You know, it seems to be a ratchet. It seems to like only go in one direction, and I don't have the answer to how to change that. Perhaps we need more people like you. 
uh, you know, you're nice to say that. Yeah. I, I, um, there's a lot of people out there. I once had a conversation, and I'm not going to name him, with a, um, a colleague of mine in the Georgia Senate who was a highly partisan Republican. And it was actually quite frustrating to me. And he was a smart guy, is a smart guy. And um, I remember, I forget what we were talking about, but there was definitely like a bill I had and I was promoting and he was against it for, you know, he had his reasons. And I remember he said to me, he was a more experienced guy than I was. Right. Um, I remember he said to me, he said, wouldn't this be a lot more fun if there were no parties? <laughs> and that's always stayed with me. And I was like, oh yeah, you, he actually sort of expressed that. He put that into words. Right. Um, you know, he was acknowledging that we were in a partisan problem and that had he not have been a Republican and I had not been a Democrat, right. we probably could have found an answer, but we both had the burden of the increased partisanship. Right. George Washington would have been proud. You know, I guess the, the so. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I'm not going to name him, but I'm sure he would be surprised to know that that I'm still talking about that. Exactly. <laughs> and that sort of brings me to my the final question sure, that I have for sure. you is that well, you mentioned the Florida recount. Yeah. It's really interesting that, of course, the lawyers, the legal professionals, were taking the charge uh, in the recount efforts for both camps, right? For yeah, the, uh, yeah. for Governor Bush yeah. and for Vice President Al Gore. But the leaders of those two, at least the Florida uh, Florida based efforts, were Warren Christopher. And James Baker, two yeah, former yeah, secretaries. Yeah, they of the were state. The, sort of the clients. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps you are destined to go to the State Department. Oh, <laughs> right. Maybe. Maybe. And, that's, it's interesting. Right. Yeah. So after your time in the Georgia State Legislature, President Obama came into office. You were nominated to be ambassador to Singapore. And then, in a sense, when you arrived in Singapore as ambassador, that was your first time uh, sort of steeping uh, at least official diplomacy, right? And representing the United States as a government official. Absolutely. Yeah. When yeah. you first arrived there, was it difficult for you to build rapport and trust with the diplomatic service staff, which I imagine are amazing? But then you are, in a sense, a, one of the new uh, ambassadors in the region, and perhaps they've stayed at the embassy for much longer. Yeah. What did you first do when you arrived at the embassy? Yeah. Well, it, it sort of happens even before you arrive, right? So the U.S. has a system. It's actually, oftentimes people say it's a unique system of political appointees, but it's actually not unique. I mean, there are other countries who have um, diplomats who are political appointees as opposed to career um, um, foreign service officers or career State Department employees. Um, and in the U.S., and you know, these are rough numbers, and they actually change from time to time. There's about 25 or 30 um, po political years. appointees. There, you know, there's. I don't know what the statistics are. You know, sometimes there's more, sometimes there's fewer. But the the ballpark is there's a there's you know there's about 25 or 30 um, political appointees who serve as U.S. ambassadors in missions abroad. Um, usually those are the bilateral missions with, you know, host countries, but there are other sort of ambassador level diplomats that, you know, participate in multilateral um, organizations, the UN, NATO, um, the EU, not NATO, I'm sorry, the EU, you know, where there are U.S. ambassadors representing the United States, and oftentimes those are political appointees. So to start with, in the U.S., we have this huge career foreign service, and then these sort of relatively few, a couple of dozen, if you will, politically appointed ambassadors. And you would think that there would be resentment. You would think that the, the, the first thing that would happen is the, the big group of people who have been like working their way up through the ranks would resent the guys who basically, you know, come in at the top. And, you know, they're, they're given this rank of ambassador, something that, that these thousands of people are working towards against the odds, most of whom will never sort of achieve that. And here you kind of are given the parachute and you come in. But I did not find there to be resentment. I'm, there may have been quiet resentment, but I found, I found there to be acceptance. Now, there was acceptance for, for a couple of reasons. One, it wasn't a surprise, right? So, you know, this is the deal. They know that we have this system that people like Warren Christopher or James Baker come out of the business community or out of the legal community and they serve in government at the highest levels. So everyone in America sort of understands that that's common, it's the tradition, it's the custom, and it's been very effective, right? We've had, you know, those two are great examples. Amazing guys became, you know, not just ambassadors, secretary of state, you know? And, and so there, there was an acceptance. Um, the second thing is I, you know, I like to think, you know, I kind of, 
was humble and I was a listener and a learner and I was a hard worker. And, you know, um, I'm hoping that people looked at my track record before I got to the State Department and they said, yeah, look, this guy has had success. He's he's been a bipartisan legislator. He's had a big law practice. He's, you know, done pro bono. He's, you know, some, some of these other things. So they said he has succeeded in what he's done. It's not like, you know, he came out of nowhere. I mean, he has a track record of success. And I like to think that the Obama appointees all had that in common, that we were all people who had a uh, track record of being hard workers and smart and good judgment. And, you know, like everyone who's successful in this world and, and a little bit lucky. Um, and, and maybe most importantly, had the trust of the president. And so that's one of the things you had when you came in as a political appointee that the career foreign service officers, for the most part, I'm sure there are exceptions, did not have. And that is you had a relationship with the president. Um, presumably you had his ear, so to speak. He certainly trusted your judgment. And that was really valuable. That was really valuable internally in the U.S. government as you were trying to, to, to navigate the rapids there. And then it was especially powerful when you went and represented the United States abroad. Um, so, so I feel like I earned some trust and I feel like sort of my predecessors as political appointees, you know, I had benefited from the sort of good work they had done. And, and, and that's both in Republican and Democratic uh, administrations. Then I arrive at the embassy um, and um, they had been without an ambassador for some time because uh, my predecessor um, in the Bush administration um, had, I don't remember exactly what the timing is, but she had resigned her position earlier. earlier. She didn't wait until January 20th. And, you know, there was just some time. So they had been waiting for an ambassador. Um, I arrived and I guess, you know, they knew who I was and they knew enough about me. And um, almost immediately, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the first day. I don't think it was the first morning, but almost immediately I did a town hall meeting. Uh, all hands, you know, all embassy employees, locally employed staff, as well as Americans um, who were at post. Singapore is a really interesting place because um, it's it's so central to Southeast Asia that it's not just state State Department employees. You had I, uh, I may not get the number right. I think it was like 19 U.S. government agencies represented there. Virtually every part of the U.S. government is represented at the at the US embassy in Singapore. You know, the big guys from treasury and and, and defense and and commerce, but also just sort of from the agencies, you know, the DEA, the FBI, of course the intelligence agencies are represented there, the Department of Agriculture, the you know, the the TSA, the you know, sort of everyone is there. Yeah. Um and and so so I did this town hall meeting where I had everyone um and I introduced myself and I, I, I hope I gave a talk that, uh, you know, projected what sort of I'm about, which was, you know, I, you know, I always said, you know, I only ask three things of, of everyone here. Tell the truth, work hard, and get along with others. You know, that'll always work. It doesn't matter the nature of the organization. It doesn't matter the amount of um, um, the intensity um, or complexity of the issues. Um, if you do those three things, it's probably going to work out all right. Um, and and I emphasize we're going to work as a team. You come from different backgrounds. Some of you are here for one year. Some of you are here for eight years. Your local people are here for a whole career. You know, but this is going to be a single team, and this is the way it's going to work. And we engaged in a strategic planning exercise. And I hope I earn the trust um, of of everyone in in the department. And then there's the, you asked about the diplomatic community. So, you know, there's two diplomatic communities. There's your team and, you know, they, they, they report to you. At the end, you're the CEO. So you're the chief of mission. So they kind of have to get along with you. But what about these other diplomats representing these other countries or, you know, the host country um, with their whole group in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and other you know, parts of the government? How's that going to go? because you're a political appointee. And I, at first I, I was concerned. I was like, maybe there's a secret handshake that I don't know, <laughs> you know, because I didn't grow up in, right. the, in, in that, you know, there's going to be something that's going to happen that if I was an experienced diplomat, I would know exactly what it was. And there's going to be other things that, you know, I'll, I'll know. And so I don't, how am I going to sort of figure this out? But it turns out, and, and I had a, I had a, 
had a sort of a bias. It's going to sound funny to you, but when I first came to it, I had a bias against political appointees, even though I was one. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, this is probably not great to have people just come in, you know, without direct experience. But I started to realize that there is a genius to the system. And, and, and political appointees, first of all, they bring their experiences from elsewhere in American society. And that's really valuable, whether they be sort of corporate or legal or medicine or politics, wherever they come from. That's the first thing. The second thing is they bring to the position a sense of urgency, right? They're not career diplomats. They, they pretty much know this is going to be a three or four year gig, sometimes a little longer, but it's never going to be a full career. You know, they're probably going to go back into whatever they were doing before, or they're going to go back into something else, but outside of, of, of um, uh, diplomacy. And so you have a sense of urgency about it. You're like, I'm going to make the list. I'm going to do the strategic plan and I'm going to execute. And by the way, it's going to be a three or four year plan. It's not going to be a 10 year plan. Yep. And that's really healthy. Um, and, um, career diplomats have sort of different equities at stake. Um, they also want to accomplish big things and do great things, but the culture in the state department is one of continuity. Go slow. More cautious. Caution. Caution. Um, diplomats shouldn't be big risk takers. Don't get me wrong, but there's a balance and you can also be too cautious. So. I think we've got it just about right in the US. We have this small group that comes in with a sense of urgency. Oftentimes, they're at the top of their professions. Um, they're, they're leaders from experience, and in some cases, natural leaders. And they, they, they come in with the respect of their own sort of bureaucrats and career foreign service officers, and they're asked to interact with them. In Singapore, you know, I was the only political appointee in Southeast Asia. And when you look at all of East Asia, there were only three of us. Um, John Huntsman was the in chief Beijing. of mission in Beijing. Um, John Roos was the chief of mission in Tokyo. And I was the chief of mission in Singapore. And then um, uh, uh, the ROK, South Korea, from time to time has had a political appointee. Sometimes it's been um, a military leader. I think Henry Harris had it um, recently. Minister, yeah. yeah, yeah. So different people have had that. And then Australia and New Zealand, which you know are also in the region, are also typically political appointees. But my interaction was with um, Huntsman and then Gary Locke um, and then John Roos in Tokyo. And then everyone else was a career foreign service officer. So it's interesting because, you know, arguably those are like the three biggest capitals. You know, those are like three really important places. The other capitals are, of course, very important, but those, you know, Singapore and Tokyo and Beijing. Geopolitically, are they are a lot more. Really big places. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like, I hope, um, we kind of built a team with the politicals and the careers from all of East Asia. I know in Southeast Asia, sort of the 10 of us who had posts, um, in bilateral ASEAN relationships felt like we worked really well together. I tried my best to communicate with everyone. I did um, trade missions um, to Malaysia, to Indonesia, to Myanmar, to, Myanmar. to Vietnam, you know, not to all of the ASEAN countries, but to some of the, some of the what I think were very important countries for different reasons. In each case, I was received you know, beautifully by the, the, the US mission there. They viewed it as very positive. Singapore was the place where, you know, generally, generally the American businesses used their, you know, had as their headquarters to, to you know, cover all of Southeast Asia and sometimes all of Asia. So I had big decision makers and oftentimes very extensive operations of US businesses in Singapore. So when I was doing like a trade mission, it was, it was, it was, yeah. it was great. You know, I came with, you know, sort of the plane load of business leaders and it was really good if you were sitting in, 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 uh, Hanoi or you were sitting in Jakarta or you were sitting in, in KL, they, they were happy. I also did a business mission to India, you know, outside of Southeast Asia and Tim Romer, I remember was the U S ambassador in India and was, it, it was, uh, it was great. It was great teamwork. So, um,
It's a long answer. Yes. Well, but thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. And before before we finish it, I just wanted to say that I grew up in China during the ambassadorships of John Huntsman and Gary Locke. Okay. So it's a such a particular honor for me to be in your class. You were the ambassador at the same time as they were, uh, you know, in China at the time. It's a tremendous honor for me to learn from you this semester. Thank you so much for everything. Well, you're nice to say that. I'll, I'll say one last thing um, to people who are interested in diplomacy and and. What I came to fully appreciate is, at least for American diplomats, um, it's a relay race. So, so the, the you know everyone who is lucky enough to serve in as either the chief of mission or or a diplomat at any level representing the United States, um, you know, you you get the baton and you run your leg, and you run as hard as you can. And then pass it on. But it's really important that you're careful not to drop it and that you pass it to someone and then let them run their leg. So, so I hope that's the way people think about it. That's always the way I thought about it. It was, it was very important to me to make sure that it was a sure handoff and that I had, had given it all during my you know almost four years. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for everything. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Great.